apparently we're live. Hey everyone, my name is Nom Zamambata and welcome to the Take Your Shot series. It's a little different setting today. Usually it's just me, my camera and everybody else on Insta sending all these comments so I'm missing everyone's comments and you know giving that 10 second of like coming in. Hello everyone, welcome. Welcome to the Take Your Shot series with the Earthshot Prize and multi-choice. There's about six cameras in studio today, but the most important thing is these three brilliant minds who I will get to chat to today. And uh, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for making it possible. Now, if you're new around here, what is the Earthshot Prize Namzamo? The Earthshot Prize is a global environmental prize that was started by His Royal Highness Prince William, as well as the Royal Foundation. The Earthshot Prize is there to highlight, it's there to discover, but also it's there to empower global minds who are coming up with the most sustainable, scalable, and innovative solutions to tackle some of our greatest environmental and climate change plights. Of course, if you're new around here and you're wondering to yourself, what is the Take Your Shot series? The Take Your Shot series we've had with MultiChoice, who is continuously enriching lives, but also MultiChoice is the official African broadcaster for the Earthshot Prize. And MultiChoice took it upon themselves to say, why don't we start a Take Your Shot series? This series is there to highlight and also bring light to African innovators who are absolutely coming up with the most incredible solutions, but also inspiring the next generation that they too can take up their tools and make a difference. The Earthshot Prize has five pillars of the sustainable goals. Five of them are protect and restore nature, build a waste-free world, fix our climate, revive our oceans, and clean our airs. And two of the gentlemen who are on the <laughs> stage today next to me are actually nominated and are finalists in the same category, which is clean our air. But before we get to them, before we start picking their brains, where is the Earthshot Prize happening? Earthshot Prize is happening right here in the mother city on the African continent in Sauda, Mzansi, South Africa, in Cape Town. The beauty, the splendor. One thing about Cape Town, have you, have you been to Cape Town before? Yes. Oh, you've been before? Yes. Okay. Are, are we all fans of Cape Town? Yeah. Deep Deep fans. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little too soft. Are we fans of Cape Town or not? Yeah, we are. Oh, goody. Mm. Yeah. Good. Okay, we'll get into that because yeah. I need to find out where your favorite spots are for Cape Town. Mm -hmm. Just in case anybody who's uh, watching from around the world is wondering what to do when they mm. come to Cape Town. Mm -hmm. Now, let me introduce our three finalists who hail from this beautiful, beautiful continent that we all call home. The founder of Keep It Cool. Keep It Cool is nominated in Build a Waste-Free World category. It was founded by Francis Ndiretu. Keep It Cool addresses food waste in Kenya and Uganda with sustainable refrigeration for small farmers and fishers. Their solutions reduce spoilage and improve income stability for fisherfolk and farmers. We are sitting in the middle of the world's largest desert lake. The ambient temperatures can be as high as 40 degrees. Instead of staying two days in the lake fishing, fisher folk end up staying weeks to get the same fish that they caught maybe 10 years ago. And with global temperatures going up, this can only get worse for these communities here. We have to present sustainable solutions to reduce the impact of rising global temperatures. I'm Francis Nderitu, and we are Keep It Cool. And I'm going to show you how we are reducing food waste in rural Africa through affordable cold storage and logistics. I've always waited for this. <laughs> Coming from a farming family, my parents would always complain that we are not getting enough money for the produce that we have. To me, it's extremely important that the people who experience the problem find the solutions because no one else understands that problem better than them. 
The first laptop I bought with my own money, it was everything. And that's what I really used as a launch pad to be able to develop Keep It Cool. Our vision for Keep It Cool is we want Fisher Fox to keep it cool. It being the produce that they have to be more climate resilient. Currently, the fish is exposed to high temperatures and losses here can be as high as 40%. We provide cooling solutions so that they can reduce that wastage from the boat all the way to the plate. Before Keep It Cool, the fishermen catches the fish and they try to force that fish to the market. In our case, we survey the market and then come to the fisher folk and tell them this is the sizes that we want creating a sustainable ecosystem. That was Francis Nderi too from Keep It Cool. What incredible work. Oh my goodness. Okay, moving on to the Clean Our Air finalist. Founded by Sam Goldman and Najib Tozun, we have Ronald Fende, who is representing the company and he is the chief financial officer. D Light brings affordable, clean energy to rural communities across Africa and India, revolutionizing access with pay as you go solar home systems, 60 countries and one of the world's largest solar home suppliers. Delight. We will celebrate all the many advancements that we have in technology, but all that means is the people without access to energy are getting further and further away from where the rest of the world is. I mean, the estimate right now is in sub-Saharan Africa, the 600 million people without access to energy. Um, for me, something that's very dear to my heart is education. And you know, if you take you know, the simple example of a child that is growing up in a household that doesn't have, have access to energy, i.e. light, they can go to school with other children, but when they get home, they cannot do their homework at night because they do not have access to something as simple as light. Yes, they could try to do that through a kerosene light, through a candle, but that is challenging. And that child then already is disadvantaged from day one. And you know, that cycle of poverty continues generationally within that family. And by breaking down that cycle, you start creating opportunities for all of these people that previously didn't have access to light. Sitting right next to Ronald, is another finalist in the Clean Our Air category. GAYO, which stands for Green Africa Youth Organization, is led by Desmond Alignois in Ghana. GAYO's zero waste model drives sustainable waste development and management, creating jobs and supporting circular waste systems for underprivileged communities. They say that they want to reduce air pollution by 70%. As the world sees waste, Gaius sees an opportunity to make a leap to create jobs and to ensure just inclusion. The air quality in Nagbobuloshi, even though now the, the site is like, I would say, 80% closed down, it's still really bad. But it is nothing compared to that time, because that time you see very, very smoky, uh, 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 atmosphere. It's very thick, it's very dark, even though it is in the morning. And then you see so much burning happening in different parts of the, 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 the place. Waste management is a very huge problem in Ghana, and it is even a more a bigger problem in the city of Accra, because the population keeps growing, and there is more and more waste that is being generated. So what they want to do is to get rid of it right and sometimes getting rid of it is mean they, they dump it in the lagoon or they set it on fire so that it can disappear it's so toxic that can cause uh, severe uh, health problems there is a world that waste doesn't need to exist and that world is where waste becomes a resource each um, every day each and everyone find use for a particular kind of waste. That's the world that we are trying to uh, take everybody to. Talk about African innovation. It is just on another level, in a different scale and a different plane. What an absolute privilege to be sitting here with you gentlemen. 
thank you. Thank you for inspiring the next generation, but the current generation as well, to show that African innovation when it comes to sustainability and also environmental is really, really paramount. And, and of course, that it's scalable, it's accessible, and it mm -hmm. can reach the world. Just yeah. incredibly inspired. Desmond, I'm gonna, I'm gonna start with you, right? You mm -hmm. are nominated, or a finalist, I should probably say, in Clean Our Air, mm -hmm. right? And so, I'm gonna throw a spanner. We speak a lot about sustainability, but also waste management. Waste management is a very big topic, particularly on the African continent, right? I do wonder, because we didn't quite grow up in, in having formal conversations in the household, especially as mm -hmm. Africans, about waste management and recycling, yeah. right? Yeah. That's the reality of it. Was there anything that you noticed as a child that particularly sparked your inspiration to start Gaio? Yeah, definitely, most definitely. So, uh, like you put it, we didn't grow up having to talk about some of these topics in a formal setting, beca sure. mainly because we didn't really have the need to. Um, but I do remember in, on many occasions where um, my dad would use the glass bottle that came with maybe whiskey or something to store uh, bees or any uh, of the cereals uh, mm. that will be used to plant in the, the next season. Mm. And sometimes they mix it with ash and then they store it there. It doesn't really get weevils and other things like that. But that's some sort of reuse culture right there. For sure. I, I used to take care of my dad's animals when I was uh, a bit younger. And most of the time, I've put my granite or millet in the, the, the leg uh, of, uh, of his trousers. So when the trousers <laughs> is old, they don't really just throw it away. They, they tie the bottom of it and then put some handles. And then we use that as children to store anything, water, whatever we want right. to carry around with our bottles and what have you. That's like a way of reusing waste, uh, things that would have been thrown away, right? Sure. Um, so these things sort of put some, some uh, comes back. Uh, immediately you see waste on the, on the street and you see waste choking drainages and mm. you realize, mm. why are we doing away with the basic, basic things that we picked up when we were growing up? Sure. It's partly because, we, yeah, we never really had a conversation and say, hey, this is waste and how do we recycle or how do we upcycle or repurpose them? Right. But these things, we picked them as kids as we, we were growing up and that comes back every time you find yourself pushed against the corner. It really does. Two things are coming up to mind. When a, when a butter uh, Tupperware, when butter was done, it was used to store like leftover food. Oh, <laughs> or, um, you know, an orange sack suddenly became a scrub to mm. wash yourself with. Yeah. So I'm yeah. thinking of all you those see? things right now where it's <laughs> like, oh my goodness, yeah. yes. The, the, the repurposing, the reusing. Yeah. Now you are a finalist this year for the Earth Star Prize. And we obviously yeah. know the global impact of the Earth Star Prize and what that comes with to even be recognized. What does that feel for you? What is that feeling for you today, sitting here, just thinking you're in Cape Town and the Earthshot Week starts tomorrow and you are a finalist. You have to wait until Wednesday, of course, to find out if, <laughs> yeah. if you're yeah. getting the big one. Yes. How are you feeling and what has the impact of the Earthshot Prize been for you? First of all, it comes with a lot of visibility. So already, right from the time we were announced um, uh, uh, in September, you, you find a lot of presence on social media mm -hmm. and of course also physically, municipalities, local government yes. going like, oh, tell me more about your, your project, right? So the visibility has been really great. And then it's an exciting moment because it, it's a symbol of endorsement. It's a symbol of recognition that, Absolutely. hey, what you are doing, the world is looking. It is a solution that is appreciated and it's needed and it's happening at the right time right. Uh, and fitted for the, the right kind of people. So, and then coming to Cape Town, of course, that's also, I'm coming from Ghana and I, I, I live in the city of Accra. So I was just you in can Ghana. appreciate that Cape Town is quite uh, a different topography and very beautiful. So mm -hmm. that's, that in itself is really exciting. And then we have the big one coming, which is uh, the Ed Short Week, which is starting from tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And um, on Wednesday, we get to hear uh, out of the 15, who among the five gets sure. to go home with the prize. But beyond that, there's also the, the, the presence of potential funders, potential collaborations that could be formed 
out of this. So mm -hmm. it's really an exciting week and I can't really wait to start it. <laughs> I can't wait to start it too. Yeah. I'm glad you're talking about the networking because that's really what it is about. You yeah. know, um, it would be remiss if you didn't think that uh, at the core of the Earthshot Prize and Earthshot Week is really about that. Yeah. How do you connect with potential investors? Because there's so many who are coming from all over the world who support the mission of the Earthshot Prize, but most importantly, who see the potential, right? Yeah. In terms of investments, and we've got many, many exciting announcements to make. Yeah. Now, on that topic of networking, on that topic of seeding into, I want to ask you, with the mission of Gaio, there has to be a scalability uh, yeah. element to it. Mm -hmm. How do you scale the knowledge to take that knowledge, to take it to the underprivileged and to take it to the underserved communities mm -hmm. so that they too can have a better understanding and a better language when it comes to waste management? Because we want to be able to touch every single person in different communities, right? Around the world, Around actually. The world. So, so actually, we, we, we are currently already working at five locations. When we started, it was more like a pre-urban area that I had to really pilot it and see before we build the confidence to even go to the city of Accra. Mm. Um, since then, the scaling model has been that we want to be able to educate people on house separation, household separation of the waste. And then we set up buyback centers. And th they drop these waste at the buyback centers. Of yes. course, they get... To, to get a token for, for that uh, money. And then we have the material recovery facility, which is like a fiscal space where you compost, you recycle, you aggregate a lot of the waste, and then you have private sector recycling companies coming in. So it's like on a normal day, a big market space where you have so many people having different interests. There's and a then, whole economy Exactly, to it. it's a whole economy on its own. And mm. then waste pickers, young people along the value chain are really you know, innovating and taking advantage of That's that. It. So the idea now to grow from that from one to five and before coming here we just had 13 more uh, local governments signing up for that. The wow. idea is to be able to scale that in terms of within the country, within Ghana, but also to export this proof of concept across sure. Africa That's because it. already we've started um, uh, piloting in, in Uganda. And, and I was just talking earlier that Botswana is on the list for 2025. And the whole idea is if you can prove this concept is working in one place and then to another place, up to five places and in the city of Accra, that gives you the, the, the opportunity to then justify that. Africa, we have so many problems that are so similar. Sure. Even though we are, our countries would have some little dynamics in one uh, here and there, but then this is a problem that is also shared by mm. African countries. And so it is a solution that's being called for. We have so many uh, cities and mayors of different cities who are showing interest. We need to be able to scale up to that level where they also have the opportunity to uh, implement. Bravo. Another thing that you've been able to scale is the employment. Because I understand that you've been able to, to, to employ hundreds of people yes. through the initiative of Gaio. Can yes. you expand on that, please? Yes. So, so the way the model works is that, so Gaio is a youth-led gender balance organization. So core staff for Gaio, we have offices in Ghana, multiple offices in Ghana, and then we have office in Kampala. We have an office in also Botswana. And then we also have presence in nine other African countries where mm -hmm. we just have projects, but without, uh, without having offices. And we will all... Um, uh, bear with me that young people graduating from university or high schools across Africa, one thing that's really common is the unemployment sure. because almost every country is struggling with that. So we serve as that first time opportunity for young people to really be able to get employment. But beyond that, the other sector of employment is really, we see ourselves as facilitators mm. of the innovation. We see ourselves as people who create and catalyze the entrepreneurial ideas that people are having. Mm. So we open this space and help people who are already along the value chain and thinking of, we have urban gardeners who are young people in the city of Accra, mm. mainly because they came from the background of having to learn how to compost uh, at our site sure. or we train them in uh, clusters and then they begin to say okay urban gardening is really something that's missing and that's the gap I want to mm. fulfill right we have others who are into recycling textile waste is a very uh, key example in mm. the city of Accra now we now have fashion brands that are mainly using 
material that would have been thrown into sure. the, the, the dustbin or, uh, or something like that. We have this term, Obroniwa, which is like um, uh, dead white man's clothes. So it's like wasted textile waste that's really brought into the country um, for, it's called secondhand clothing. So for people who would want to use that. But normally we open a bale of the clothes and then half of it is really waste from start. So sure. what these young people are also taking advantage is that they now bring that to the material facility where there's a space for innovation. Mm. They repurpose that into really beautiful clothes Absolutely. and and what have you. And that is these are jobs that we are creating for people who otherwise would have struggled to also Absolutely. find opportunities in mainstream employment. But that's what it is, it's finding that innovative solution, it's getting into that gap and, exactly. and filling that gap and exactly. being a bridge to it. Exactly. You've spoken about expanding into other countries, but so on is next, <laughs> getting into local governments. Yeah. What, what is next? For, for Gaio, what's next? Right, right, right now, we, 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 like, I, like I was telling you, already we, we're trying to not only stay within that, but also we're building capacity to demonstrate youth leadership mm. in, 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 in actually championing solutions across Africa. But, but also we are, we are in a position where we, we recognize that even with this, we are not able to really uh, solve all the problems by ourselves. So we're trying to bring on board more and more partners to be able to strengthen sure. our base, both in Ghana and also in the Af other African countries. We've been connecting with a lot of youth-led groups, especially Fantastic. in other African countries, trying to really support them because we've developed a manual, which is the zero waste strategy. So that's basically like how you can move from point A to Z in terms of implementing the zero waste model that we are mm. having. And we are encouraging a lot of people. We got a, a group in uh, Mali that actually uh, had us to go there and train them, and then they came for uh, revaluation. And then we helped them implement in Bamako in 2022, and they are doing uh, pretty okay. So we're now trying to really open that, that we want to expand, we want to scale to other countries. Brilliant. That's the idea, but we also want to create that opportunity for other people who want to mm. implement it with or without us to be able to implement it by putting the knowledge out there to make it accessible and to make it replicatable. I mean, you did say to facilitate the innovation. Yeah. So we look forward to it. And for anyone who's yeah. watching, please go to the Earthshot Prize YouTube page. There's a beautiful, beautiful documentaries on each and every finalist, and you will find the final, the, the Gaio video there. And I think it's just, it's gonna bring even more light into the work of Gaio and of course the innovation that they are truly championing and are brilliant, brilliant at. Ronald? I, I'm over to you, my friend. Yes, <laughs> let's do it. Just after your very healthy rival, yes. <laughs> as you said, there's a there's a good space in between there. Exactly. You know, what's a what, what, what's a competition without some healthy competition, right? Exactly. A little competitive spirit. Now, Ronald, your story with D Light began with the mission to bring clean, safe lights to communities. Can you share more on that vision and share more on, on, on how that story even expanded? Okay. So I'll start off by saying, just in sub-Saharan Africa, there are 600 million people that yeah, have no still. access to energy. Yes. And the majority of those, they use kerosene as a source of light and energy. Now, as most of us, especially on the, on the continent know, one, there's the health risk, the smoke, the dark smoke that spews when you're burning kerosene. But the other, the actual fire risk, I think we all have read or heard of stories of, you know, a child has, having been burned or injured because they knocked over a kerosene lamp. You know, this is very real in our, in our lives, right? And, and, and the story of D-Light starts there where one of our founders actually experienced this. He was in Benin mm -hmm. and his neighbor's son was burned by a kerosene lamp. Sure. Fortunately, the child survived, but with severe b burns. And then this became, this cannot continue. How do we resolve this? And you know, you come to, to Africa, lots of sunlight. So let's provide energy mm. that is renewable and that is safe. And that was really the beginning of, uh, of, of the idea, uh, to, to develop solar, solar lamps or solar light. Sure. It then you know, continued to now progress to produce what are called solar home systems. Now, a solar home system becomes a source of energy for a house, mm. 
right? It says, now you can plug in appliances, you can plug in a radio, mm. so you have access to information. I can plug in my TV, I've got entertainment. Mm. I can charge my mobile phone. We all move around with mobile phones, but if I have no access to energy, I can't charge that phone. You can't, and, and you can't have access to the world. Exactly, and if you think about it, in Africa, most of, most of us access the internet through our mobile phones. Sure. So all those people are cut away from, you know, from, from that part of the economy of the world. Mm. So we then develop the solar home systems, the appliances to go with them, etc. Then two challenges. How do you get them to the people? Mm. And the second, well, the, your target market, can they afford them? Absolutely. Right. So, so it's the, the logistic and, and it's the affordability. Exactly. So from an access, the first thing we said, okay, fine, we want to be able to distribute to every corner, whichever country we're in, you put a pin in it, I must be able to get my product there, hmm. right? So we said, the only way to do this is you've got to work with local communities. So we'll bring in the product, we manufacture them, central warehouse, then we work with local small business owners. They become our sub-distributors. So you've got you know, your local shop, in South Africa you call it a spaza shop, mm. you become a distributor and you mm. become a hub. And we actually pay you for stocking a product. But I've got to ask you, because now you've gone into my second question, yeah. about the evolution and how you evolve into, yeah. you know, because clean energy is very critical, yeah. particularly to rural Africa, yeah. yes. right? How do you evolve in terms of getting into that scalability, finding those communities, finding your, um, I'm going to call them agents, yeah. <laughs> for lack of a better term. Yeah. How do you do that? How, how, what are the economies of scale when it comes to that? So, so I, I will answer you, I'll get there, Let's right? Let's go. All right, so maybe let me talk the model. So the model works in, as I said, you've got the local distributor. Mm. Then we get local agents that actually then do the selling. Now we're creating employment. Of course. All right. Right now, across the continent, we've got 15,000 agents selling, selling for us, right? Okay, you've distributed it. Now someone needs to be able to afford it. And this is where scalability came in. Sure. Right. Most of the you know, people in the rural areas, our units generally cost somewhere between three, dollars $400. They cannot afford it. Mm. So with, this is when we came up with what's called Paygo technology, right? Now, Paygo technology, the easiest way to think of it is like prepaid electricity. Mm. Someone pays on a daily basis. Now, that's key. Most of, our, most of our customers earn their money on a daily basis. So you want to give them a daily payment. I earn my money, I make a payment. When I make a payment, the unit works for the next 24 hours, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then, you know, it's repeat the next day. Most of the payments, we make them e easy, but people can play through mobile money. So it's accessible 24 hours a day. Whenever I have my money, that's when I can pay. And if you do your daily payments, after between, depending on the unit, between tw 12 and 24 months, the unit is yours, you've paid it off, and it wow. belongs to you, and again, for the next seven, nine years, you're, you've got power for free, because you've paid off, uh, you, you, you've actually paid off the unit. So the Paygo is what then created the scale, because a lot more people now could afford these units. Which means it's more accessible. It's more accessible, so it's, you've got the accessibility because it's next to you. Mm. Because again, even for most of our customers, if I have to jump onto a taxi uh, or public transport to the next town to buy, that's, that impacts my purchasing decision. Absolutely. I must be able to buy it next to me. So accessible, affordable is the key elements to, <coughs> to, to the scale. And you know, just to sort of indicate the level of scale we've been able to achieve, mm. uh, in the time we've been in operation, <coughs> we've uh, given access to energy now globally to just under 180 million people. Wow. Uh, we How many countries is that? <laughs> <laughs> so so we, 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 we operate in um, five countries, four countries in Africa okay. and then in India. But when right. we also distribute to 60 countries across the world. Wow. Right. Um, that's, that's on the actual <coughs> direct impact. Then if you go back where we started, we wanted to get rid of kerosene and get rid of the, the fumes and the, you know, the carbon dioxide emission. Right. We've offset 38 million tons of CO2. Now, Incredible. Now, just to put it in context, that is the equivalent wow. of the annual emissions of a country like Norway. Wow. Wow. That is unbelievably impressive. Thank you. It's unbelievably impressive. I mean, we speak about the big numbers of the people, mm -hmm. but I want to go deeper. Mm -hmm. 
because people occupy society. Yes. And some of the most pivotal places in society are classrooms. Yes. Hospitals. Yes. Homes. Mm -hmm. What are some of the success stories that you've been able to enjoy? And before you go, I'm going to ask for a bottle of water because Ron is about to. to <laughs> Ron's like. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. So somebody please pass me a bottle of water. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ah, thank Thanks, you. Sarah. There you yeah, go. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. And then uh, Francis as well, please. <clears throat> thank you. Got it. <laughs> back to back to back to the communities. Back yes. to the schools. Back to um, uh, uh, the classrooms mm -hmm. and 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 of course the homes. Mm -hmm. What are some of the success stories that you can say that you've enjoyed with Delight? Okay. So I, I, I maybe you know sometimes you got to start with yourself. Now, for me, one of my biggest pleasures when I was young was reading. Uh, I know, you know, many people have got their f one of their so early childhood memories. Mm. For me, one of my best childhood memories was joining the library. Yeah, Same I, I, here. I'm one of those nerds. Same here. <laughs> Same <Right>? here. <laughs> I, I totally, totally I enjoyed reading, right? Um, and, you know, when we look at what we do, one of the biggest impacts is around school-going children. Because mm. if I have no light, my day ends at 6 p.m., 7 p.m., whenever, the, you know, it's, it's getting dark. Now I have the ability to read, I've got more time to do my homework, yeah. whatever it is, I can actually progress within my education. Mm. We also track the number of school children who've had access to our products. Oh. Right now that's, that's at 75 million school going children across the world. These are children that are now able to read longer, study longer, and hopefully become more productive and successful in society. Um, you, you asked about, you know, health clinics. Yeah. That's, again, uh, uh, you know, something that we look at. We've uh, electrified, um, just last year alone, about, you know, 600 health clinics. And, you know, sometimes, you know, we all don't get it. But, you know, if you think about it, if there is no light, if someone arrives at the clinic at night, sure. nothing can happen. That mm. includes, for example, a woman in labor. Mm. Wait until the next morning. Yeah. Until there's daybreak. Until there's daybreak. So th these are, you know, the, the transformations that just simply having light brings to communities is, it's indescribable. And I want you to describe something right now. Okay. Apparently you have a saying, one foot in the city, one foot in the village. <laughs> yes. <laughs> What are you? What does that mean? I want you to. Ex to I, I can only try and imagine what it means, but I want you to better explain it. One foot in the city, one foot in the village, and how are you bridging these two worlds? Yes. Because we can't assume that it's only uh, the rural areas or the most marginalised um, mm. areas that are suffering from 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 energy, um, the lack of energy. But there's mm. of, co of, of course the city. Yeah. It's yeah. So, uh, I mean, the, the, the one foot in the city, one foot in the village is the way I describe what we do as an African. All of us, you know, whether I live in the city, yeah. we all have a family in the village, mm. right? And what we're saying is at the end of the day, just because I choose to live in the village or in the rural areas, I should not have a less quality of life. Let's end energy poverty. Let's equalize that. Mm. amongst all of us. Let's end energy poverty. What is the equalizer? Is D-Light the equalizer? We'll find out on Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> Again, just a reminder, please, please, please go and see, uh, go to the Earthshot Prize YouTube page and there are all the films from all the finalists and you will see D-Light's film right there. Thank you so much, Ronald. That was absolutely incredible. And I do not wish to be any of you <laughs> <laughs> because each solution is as brilliant as the next. Speaking of next, Francis, yep. the moment is yours. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The moment is yours. Yep. Keep it cool. Yep. Tell us about the work of Keep It Cool. Yeah, so Keep It Cool is a climate tech that is based in Nairobi, Kenya. Uh, we are providing cooling solution uh, to make them affordable and accessible to fisher folk community and mm -hmm. most underserved community in, in parts of Africa. What are some of the challenges that you um, witnessed 
was there a personal story that inspired this particular journey, that inspired you to, to really take up the tools and say, I'm going to do this and I'm going to, to find the solution and I'm going to make it an accessible and innovative and a scalable solution? Yeah, so I grew up in uh, rural Kenya. Uh, we do dairy farming. And uh, during rainy seasons, you know, the, the trucks that will come to collect milk were not able to come and get the milk. Sure. So obviously, uh, we were not able to sell uh, the products uh, because, you know, there's it's a lot of milk. And so in the background of that, you know, losing milk on, on rainy seasons, mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, fast forward when I went to university, this problem was always part of my, on the background. And when I spoke to my parents, they would always tell me, oh, we didn't sell enough milk today, or we didn't sell enough, you know, the rainy season is coming, I'm worried whether I'm going to make money or not. So when I started Keep It Cool, and was what actually... what year was this, by the way? Uh, 90s, uh, early 90s, let's say 93, 96 sure. or so. And, and so when I started uh, Keep It Cool, it was mainly to address uh, my, my family and, and my, fr my family friends' sort of problems that they had within the dairy industry. Mm. And it evolved into other value chains. You know, you get calls, people interested in the solution in other value chains. And eventually, we ended up doing it more on the fish side because the, it, was, it is a much more underserved value chain compared to others. For sure. Yeah. And, and what would you say, how would you say it's impacted local communities, particularly when it comes to skill, but also education? Yeah, so um, on transition, especially in East Africa, um, we lose up to 40% of the produce from the lake all the way to the plate because we have handling issues, we have not adequate infrastructure around the lake. And um, as you know, 200 million Africans depend on fish as the only source of livelihood. Sure. And um, the, the, the challenge continues to be, especially because we are sitting at the world largest uh, desert lake and Lake Victoria is also the world largest tropical lake mm. and so the temp as the global temperatures go up uh, the more lots of fish we are losing because people are not able to access cooling of course and and so our solution is coming to intervene that and what we are doing is to make sure that uh, even the most underserved community are able to access cooling and so we have been able to scale this solution now on Lake Trukana, which is the second largest uh, lake in Africa. Mm. And we are serving again uh, close to 30,000 livelihoods, supporting using our solar refrigeration platform. That's incredible. Yeah. How have you been able to impact all these lives and, imp and, and, and impact so many of the farmers? Yeah, it's easy. Um, is it word of mouth? Is it, what is it? <laughs> yeah, luckily, you know, like uh, the way fisher folks uh, tend to work, they work like, um, um, I know, like, like the taxi guys. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, they, the, most of the time, they're always aggregated, trying to find a better way to do business or trying to work together. And so it was easier to approach them and sit down with them and tell them that we have this solution that we think is going to reduce your losses by 98%. Wow. And yeah, it was easy decision for them because it meant more money in the pocket. Of course. And, and so did we. So we delivered about 20% increase in income in their pockets. And they're so happy about that. And of course, what you delivered is what we call from boat to plate, yes, which yes. really reflects um, your, your organization's core values, I suppose, and, and core functionings. Yeah. What would you say has been the greatest impact for you? Well, the greatest impact for me is the personal stories that people come back and say. So for example, uh, we have this woman who, was, uh, who is a fisher folk, and um, uh, she got sick. And because of this platform that we have, uh, so we have like simple contact with the fisher folk on the amounts of fish they're supposed to supply. Mm -hmm. And so as, as a value add to the services beyond the cooling, we also offer uh, insurances because now we have pulled them together. Uh -huh. So they have access now to insurance. And uh, she came back and told me, you know, without Keep It Cool, I've not been able to access the insurance, I've not been operated on. Mm -hmm. And so to me, that's a success story on its own. And it was very uh, validating and fulfilling because um, I saw my parents in her because she's the same age as my parents. And wow. when her coming and telling me, like, I really appreciate what you're doing. And please let me know what I can do because I can, I'm not able to express my gratitude to sure. you. So it was a really uh, point at, uh, at the point where I was really motivated to actually do more. 
That's brilliant. The yeah. expansion into insurance. Yes. To even think like that, you know, yeah. I suppose there's a, a people focus to it, which is absolutely incredible, right? Yeah. It's not just business as usual. You yeah. have to understand the livelihood, yes. but also the health of yeah. fishermen as well. And, yeah. and I'm glad it was a fisherwoman. Yeah. <laughs> 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 now, sustainable fishing and storage and, and distribution are key to your work. Of course, the impact is there for the entrepreneurs. But what is the impact in the communities? What is the impact that you've seen from just ordinary folk and how transformed their lives have become through, through your work? Yeah, so, you know, uh, what, what we've tried to do is basically stabilize the income for a fisher folk. Um, fisher folk is one of those, uh, the, the most equivalent of it is like a taxi, just to say. So the incomes are always You've up and down. You've got to expand on that taxi. You keep comparing <laughs> the two. And I'm like, if you don't expand, I know the comments are going crazy. And I'm like, he needs to expand on this. you got to expand on this now. Yeah, Alex, it's an informal, it's an informal uh -huh. sort of environment, you know. Like, you're not sure today I'll carry 20 passengers or it's the same thing, you know. Like, sure. carrying, using a taxi, you're not sure how many passengers you're going to have today. Mm -hmm. Fishing, you're not sure how many pieces of fish you're going to catch today. It's similar in many ways. So that's the example that I'm using. Sounds like Statistics 1000 to me, <laughs> which gives me a little bit of trauma <laughs> from my university days. Yeah, yeah. But so back to, back to the communities. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's equivalent of saying that they have an unpredictable income. So sure. they cannot be able to predict what they're going to have by the end of the day. Mm -hmm. And so what you have tried to do is uh, we go and consult the restaurants and the cafes on the demand side and we get like contracts. And then when you go to the fisher folk, you tell them, okay, we have this particular set of customers who have already placed their orders. They need about 80 metric tons of fish on a sure. weekly basis. So we are giving you this contract of 80 metric tons. Go and fulfill this contract and all of us will get paid. And uh, that's how we are able to change their, their predictability. And now they can be able to commit themselves to the job and also be able to have enough income also, because all this is paid at once, mm -hmm. to be able to meet some of the uh, important uh, uh, bills like school fees course, and all these other course. elements that are very important where you have to pay a lot of money at once, yeah. Whew, bravo. How, yeah. Many, how many fisher folk have you, uh, do you have now? So we are supporting about 30,000 fisher folks across uh, two countries. Um, and uh, yeah, mainly Sorry, Lake Victoria. Sorry, don't move past that yeah. number. Yeah. 30,000? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And of course, uh, talking about scale, this is something that is replicable across many value chains. So uh, as, as of now, we have been able to pilot across the poultry value chain, you know, and uh, we are supporting. That would make sense. Yeah, yeah. So white meat is, uh, is growing, consumption of white meat is growing very fast across our, our, our continent. And um, yeah, so it's something that is going to be very replicable across many other value chains as well. In that hope, and of course you're a finalist in, the, in Build a Waste Free World, and I'm glad that you spoke about you know, the inspiration and obviously crossing over to the poultry farming. I wanna ask you a question. What is your hope when it comes to other organizations that can be able to mirror the model of Keep It Cool? I mean, and why is it important that they should? Yeah, it's, it's extremely important because, uh, you know, in Africa, it's not food waste, it's food loss, because we know that food is not enough for all of us as it is wow. today. Yeah. So uh, we're looking at it in many ways. There is, of course, the commercial angle where everyone want, needs income. There is also the nutritional angle where people need to eat safe food, you know. Mm -hmm. And there is also the environment angle that obviously, you know, where we're trying to reduce the emission using solar energy. So to us, um, it's extremely important that, and, and also to other people that in our respective countries, communities and everything, that we really mitigate, uh, find ways to mitigate food waste because it's a loss to us because we need, so for, in our case, for example, uh, we have repurposed, uh, the, the, let's say, the, the offcuts and the byproducts to be able to be fed to the urban poor, those who are not able to buy the, let's say, the fillet of a fish or something. So we are, we are able to repurpose like the the, the gizzards or the the, or the, the, fish head. the fish head used for soup. Used for soup, mm -hmm. and and those are our fastest moving products actually. So I, I never throw away my fish head. I always turn it into a soup. So yeah, I, that's yeah. how I even know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you're a target customer. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> can I put in my order? <laughs> yeah. Like a true businessman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> There's an opportunity here. Yeah. <laughs> I'm about to sell to you after this. Please do. Yeah. Please do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, there's a lot of Im layered impact and also creation of jobs, again, uh, stabilization of income, uh, access to insurance and medical sure. health and all these other important aspects of our lives. And, yeah, so basically, you know, it's a multi-layered impact kind of uh, platform that you have built. Mm. Um, and I'm very proud that, you know, we have gotten this limelight to be able to share the story. Francis, yep. you have built and are building something incredible. Thank you. Truly. Yeah. It is groundbreaking and it is evident why you are one of the finalists. I wish your fellow finalists <laughs> very good luck yeah, thank you. <laughs> because you are a worthy contendant to beat as is the case with each and every one of you. I'm so incredibly inspired, truly. Every time I get to speak to people who are really honing in on the solutions, for me, it reinforces the, the core value of the Earthshot Prize, which is it about urgent optimism. That's what we say at the Earthshot Prize. We say urgent optimism because we can speak about the doom and gloom. We can speak about all the things that are going wrong. But we must be able to highlight. We must be able to shine a light. And we must be able to empower those who are doing the work and making it scalable and making it accessible. But most importantly, it's innovative and it's enriching lives. So thank you. Thank you for joining me on my Take Your Shot series. You have been an incredible, incredible trio to end off this Take Your Shot series. I think it might, I don't think it might be the end. I think we might be able to be doing more Take Your Shot series. <laughs> I think it's gonna continue to go uh, forward, but I'm just so incredibly grateful and so honored that I get to um, have had this conversation with you, number one, but also mm -hmm. to uh, be a partner to the Earthshot Prize and also be a partner to multi-choice. So thank you. Thank you for joining us and thank you to everyone who is watching today. Um, I'm glad that it's on YouTube because then it's gonna stay on the platform so people can always come back and watch it. Again, I'm going to reiterate, please go to the Earthshot Prize YouTube page. You will find all the films of all the 15 finalists for this year's Earthshot Prize. It's absolutely incredible. It is so inspiring and it is a very, very tough 15 and I am so glad I am not one of the judges because my good heart I'll be like everybody must win <laughs> because everybody's doing their work but of course just as a reminder the Earthshot Prize is not only about the grand prize it really is a very holistic approach when it comes to supporting innovators from around the world through networks through mentors through so many organizations global leaders and founders as well who are looking to invest so if you are thinking of entering the Earthshot Prize for next year I'm sure the information is going to come but if you're not and if you're in the world of sustainability and you want to learn even more, continue to stay on the Earthshot Prize page, continue to stay on the multi-choice page. It is officially Earthshot Week. We are in Cape Town, South Africa, the mother city, and we cannot wait to have an incredible time showcasing, highlighting, and even having the best food. <laughs> in Cape Town this week as we celebrate Earthshot Week as well as the Earthshot Prize which is going to be on Wednesday and it has flown in so many incredible people around the world who are here to support who are here to make noise about the work that we're doing at the Earthshot Prize and I cannot wait to participate in every single one of the events but of course to sit in the audience and watch everybody's nerves <laughs> as they wait to find out if they have won. Thank you so much for joining us once again. My name is Nom Zamambata, and it, is, had been, it has been an absolute pleasure. Bye.